This is the Learning About Dogs podcast featuring Kay Lawrence and Sue McGuire. Thank you for making this podcast one of the most listened to podcasts in the dog world. We appreciate the loyalty and more importantly, we think the dogs appreciate the evolved teaching and learning. This is our final episode of season four. This is the time of the year when Kay and I spend time in the gardens, playing with our dogs, hiking, and for this Californian, doing dances to bring on rain. This final episode is a little longer than our mini podcast because we are asking a very important series of questions about good training. Can you identify good training and what does it look like? It seems as if this entire season of the Learning About Dogs podcast, we have been scratching around the edges and areas of helping people determine what is good training. So we, you and I were chatting a few weeks ago that I don't, with with what we're seeing being offered up and under the guise of good marketing is not necessarily good training. So we felt due diligence, let's not be slamming everybody else. Let's just go in and say it, which is super easy to do. I mean, one of the jokes in dog training is that you get three dog trainers in a room and what will happen is that two will agree. The third doesn't know what they're doing. Um, well, it depends how good they are as trainers. Doesn't it's it? true. So let's start identifying, in our opinion, what we think is good training and how can you identify it? How can you identify it? Hmm. Well, I think those three good trainers should be able to recognize what is good about each other and not have that disagreement. The disagreement comes because it's about ego and about my method being better than everybody else's method. And this is the only way to do it. You know, and that's often the measure of a quality trainer is it's like saying, which is a good car. Well, it depends what its function is. It depends yes, what you yes, like yes. to drive. It depends where you live and what you want it to do. There's no better or best. It depends how much it meets the user's needs. Okay. But I think today, as opposed to 20 years ago, everyone is being faced with a lot of fake material that is proposing that this is good training. This is the way to do it. This is how you will succeed. And it's not good training. So, you know, as much as now we need to start learning how to see the difference between genuine news and fake news, we need to learn to see the difference between What is just marketing to get money off you? What do they call it in the States? Hustling. Yes, to get something out of you, you know, sign up for this, sign up for that, because we can promise you all this stuff. And this is going to help you sort this problem out. You know, that problem you have with your dog, which you didn't realize you had a problem with your dog until they said you have a problem with your dog. Um, You know, things that weren't problems 20 years ago. And now I can see the problem. So you must buy this course. And being able to have a look at this stuff and go, hmm, no, this is not good training. This is not good in the sense that I would want to recommend you go to it and then when I see good training I would say wow that's good that's good stuff so yes what is the difference between the two what can we point people at to have a look at I think what's fascinating to me is when people ask me what kind of training do you do I I I immediately turn around and ask them (laughs) well I do good training but I I said what what is it that you are planning to do. It's sort of like the purpose of a car. What is the purpose yes. of this dog? Yes. What is this yes. dog doing? Yes. What is what you, what life are you expecting this dog to lead? And then that will might that answers the good training this dog might need. It also comes a little bit like um, you know, when we used to run the magazine, the Teaching Dogs magazine, we said for all types of training. It was positive learning for all types of training. And people want to know well, why weren't we using why don't didn't we demonstrate how to use a shock collar properly? No, it's not the method of teaching that we were looking at. It was the outcome of the training when we meant all types of training for tracking or for search dogs or for teaching sheepdog work or for agility or for pet dog. It was all outcomes, but only the positive method. So when people say, what type of training are they talking about outcomes, which would depend on the user or the methods you're actually using, which is the route you use to get there? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I don't know if I have people just do not know. No, no, no. But why would they? Right. What type of car do you want? Well, what do you want to use it for? Exactly. Does it mean that if we look at all the, um, say, one class of cars, a, a hatchback, yep, a five-door hatchback, are all of them the same? No, they're not because they come in different qualities. 
yes, different qualities of the engineering. The one of the vehicles I had was um, uh, made, probably originally made, or at least 30, 35, 40 years ago. Um, and other companies bought the design plans and made their versions of it. If you had one of the other companies' versions of it, the metal was not as good as the company that made the original. So it rusted much quicker. So people would look at mine and go, oh, these are all rust buckets. I go, no, they're not. This is a so-and-so one. Ah, but I paid £3,000 more for my one of it so that I didn't get the um, clony version. You with me? Mm-hmm. So, you know, just because they're all the same class of vehicle doesn't mean they're all the same quality of vehicle. And I have to, you know, hands up front, I do not know good cars from bad cars, but I do know that if I I get in a good car, I have a feeling, oh, this is good, because the bits that seem good to me, like the way the door shuts and you just feel the air compress a little bit, that looks good to me because there's not mm. leaks in the car where the air is bursting out. If I'm driving it and it hits the corner and it's the corner, oh, yeah, that feels good. Or the windscreen wipers work properly. You know, those sort of things come as a good car. Would I know the difference between a really top, top, top car and a near the top car? I probably wouldn't. It'd be wasted on me. Hmm? Okay, so reeling this back to dogs, although having just bought a new car, yes, 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 all of that. (laughs) Um, I love my new car. Everybody keeps asking to buy it. I said, nope, 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 it's mine. Um, Let's... We we can't we say identify good identify good training and and can you do that can we do that well can can you actually say training's good what does it mean what's the definition yeah. of good I, I yeah this it, what good, might better be good and best for, right you know? it might be good for me may not be good for you exactly yeah 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 so to me I would say top quality training always shines through. Mm. shines through yeah and it shines through in the way the dog carries out their behaviors yeah the way the dog carries out what it's been trained to do and it wouldn't matter what field of training you're talking about again from agility to teaching search dogs to tracking man trailing you know jumping it doesn't matter you know the the good quality training shows in the way the dog carries out the work so what does the dog look like? Um, so are they able to respond to a single cue? Mm. Yeah, what does that tell me? That the person's given a cue that is easily recognized by the dog without it having to be over cued. doesn't have to say it again, again, again. It's probably the minimum it needs to give the information. It might be just a gesture, the way a word is said, it's not repeated. The dog doesn't hesitate. They set about the job straight away. So there's no, you know, even if you're walking up to a road to cross it, if I start to slow down, my dog slows down with me, it's responded to the cue that I'm slowing down because we come up to a road. Good, good quality. Even the dogs learnt that. That's what they should be able to read from the person. That tells me that that person's got the self-awareness and discipline to be able to give the cue in a way that's always recognizable by the dog. So if they're going to ask the dog to um, go search, yes, yeah, so let's say the word is go search, search. They don't go search, 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 mm-hmm. and change it every time they use it. And the dog goes, mm, is that the same or it's not? It doesn't sound quite the same every time. Sometimes they use a hand gesture so the dog hasn't learned the word correctly. So there'll be a discipline that's a physical discipline of the gestures and the body language as well as the verbal cues they're delivered in a consistent way and the dog can trust that they've understood what that means when it's said yep there's no doubt in the dog's face when they go sure i will go retrieve that sure i will start tracking sure i will take this jump and presume i'm going to land on something on the other side yes or yes you want me to do heel work you want me on the left you want me on the right i understand these things so then again the dog would carry out that behavior and it's it's full of what I would call understanding. The dog has, yep, no problem. I'm going to set off and do this because I also trust that I am going to get rewarded at the end of this job. Even though I might enjoy doing the job, there will be something in it for me to be able to do this job. And that comes again from understanding enough about the reinforcement and reward relationships that 
the dog will work towards that end goal. And that end goal might just be doing something with you. You know, it doesn't have to be toys or food or whatever's going to be an obvious reward. It could be the intrinsic value of doing things together. I think that so the way the dog carries uh, it out and sets off on that cue, oh, good training. Six yeah, I was away. going to say it is that there is a, a sig- it's like identifying art. It's There's a significant difference, in my opinion, of a dog doing exercise A, exercise B, and a dog doing exercise A, exercise B. I mean, just this, this, uh, this presence that they bring. Um, yes, yes, yes. And also, you know, from the, the, if I'm looking at somebody who's saying, hey, come see my training system, it's good, you should buy this, I would want to see that they can apply it to many different fields, if you like. So in other words, they could either do the same sort of training with different dogs, the same dog, but in many different conditions, or with many different exercises. Yes, or if they are selling they're teaching. I want to know that they can teach many different types of people. Mm-hmm. Yes, we, we have people that do certain dog sports, and the only people that teach are the people that are their own age group or their own sex or their own you know, culture. They don't teach across the board. So that, to me, again, is another indication of quality, that they've got the experience, and what has come from that experience is their ability to apply it and adapt it so they can understand it well enough that they can adapt it to whatever that person that is learning from them needs or whatever that dog is learning from them needs. You know, it's not this just one single type fits the bill. And if you don't fit my bill, then you can't train with me. Yeah, and we see that in yeah. dog training. You know, there's oh, people that do. go through several dogs because those dogs just were this, that and the other. And we don't see them again from those first puppy videos because they couldn't adapt their training to that dog, what that dog needed. So, yes, I want to see across the width as well the quality and and Mm. i want to see i want to see less of this is the system you know we talk about this a lot the recipe the recipe people oh yes you know it's not it's not it's not you it's not it's not it's 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 well because every good trod trainers our three good dog trainers standing together know that it's not a recipe it has to be adapted yeah and they would all agree on that Mm-hmm. They would all agree on that. So we need the dog to go and fetch something from over there. Okay, so what type of dog is it? How big is the article they're going to fetch? Are they experienced enough to go over that sort of terrain to do it and come back again? You know, those are all the questions we're going to be asking before we do the training or before we decide what teaching route we're going to take to teach this youngster how to do it. Mm-hmm. There's so much marketing, though, of this stuff. There's so much, and I, and we oh, wanted yeah, to yeah, do yeah, this episode, yeah, yeah. not to not to say you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, but to say if you do sign up for it, these things you should be looking for. What are yeah, some of the and, things yeah, yeah. they should be looking for? Like so, um, I mean, I'm also looking for, um, you know, how the dog carries it out. Would I want my dog to look like that dog? Because that's what sold me on a particular sport uh, decades ago. I watched a Border Collie doing something with a guy, and I thought, I would love my dog to look like that. Mm -hmm. So I followed him for quite a while. Now I'd be called a stalker. (laughs) I wanted to learn how he did it. Um, And it was just being able to watch him was just a joy. You know, watch the partnership, watch the things they had together. So that element is probably accessible to everybody. Is this what I want? Yes. It's just... It's not that, um, so what was I watching the other day? You know, we want to be positive and say this is what to look for. But little giveaways to me are watching demonstration videos where the dog is hauled in to do the stuff on the video. And then the minute they've done their bit while the dog's being talked to, the person just disengages with the dog and then talks back to camera. Or if they're in a training environment, they will be training the dog and then suddenly start talking to a friend. It's that sort of disrespect to the dog, that disengagement. And then the dog's sitting there going, are we finished? Are, have I got to wait here? Um, are you talking to me or are you talking to a person? And the dog's just, oh, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And then they get told because they're not focused. They had to go on focus exercises. Mm-hmm. You know, it's well, you cause the disfocus. You cause the disengagement yourself because it was all about, oh, look at me, camera, camera, camera. This is what I'm talking about. 
So, you know, that sort of live training that we're watching, it just makes me very uneasy that the dogs are going to not benefit from it unless the person's that sort of trainer that is able to ask the dog to take a break and the dog goes, sure, I'm good for a moment. And then they present to camera and then they say to the dog, hey, would you like to do some more training? Sure, says the dog. And they get up and re-engage. You know, unless you've got that skill to be able to say, take a break for a moment. I need to just top up my treats. I need to change my jacket. I need to answer my phone and not cause the dog uncertainty. Those are good, good elements of good quality training. Things like in sports. Um, so my particular sport is here at Music. We go into the middle of the ring and the guy plays the music and I go, no, that's not my music. But I'm already standing there in a pose with the dog doing this, that and the other ready to go. Oh, that's not my music. OK, he says, what's your music? I said, well, the one I gave you earlier on. And we're having this conversation across the ring. So then we have to go back over to the DJ saying, no, that's not my music. My name is Sansa Sansa. Oh, he got it wrong. Blah, blah. Sorry. Cool. Doesn't matter. We go back to the middle of the ring, do it again. To me, that is, can I disrupt my training, cope with a difficult situation and say to the dog, hey, should we have another go? And he goes, yeah, sure. Because he's got the experience of that happening. I've prepared him for that eventuality. I took my dogs out. One was four years old. One was only about seven months old. And we were going away for a week. And I was sort of searching around for places to be able to take them for a walk around by the like a hotel. And we're just on the way back to the car. And what should happen? But a hot air balloon starts to come down between me and the car. Oh, oh my God. Wow. <laughs> just like, and I'm going, oh. Now, the youngster was like, oh, okay, hot air balloon, seven months old. That's good. The four-year-old absolutely freaked out. And we're trying to go backwards around the edge. So he can't see this fire breathing emergency. This was not a planned landing. This was a serious moment. And it was coming down by the side of the road. And he was obviously trying to avoid the road. And it was, oh, dear, 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 dear. And have we prepared our dogs for those sort of difficult situations? Yes, because they, they, they have a trust in me that staying with me will be OK because I've protected them from truly frightening situations i haven't had to go out and put them in frightening situations to learn that it's come from minor situations being an issue and then turning to me for more information mm -hmm. and i supply the information so mm -hmm. you know it's the preparation that you can see that's in the dogs that when things go wrong it's okay we'll get through it we'll manage this we'll do it and it works the other way around as well where you're thinking oh my goodness, I'm in the ring or I'm in a place doing something with a dog and things are going very, very wrong and I need the dog to help me out. And the dog goes, it's okay, we'll manage this and they'll help you out. You know, the, um, you know, the competition times that I've thought, my God, how on earth is the dog going to manage this? And they'll just go, it's not a problem, I'll do it. Sheepdog trials, send the dog up the hill and the fog just comes down like bang. I can't see the dog. I can't see the sheep. And I'm like, oh. so I turn around and look at the judge in the car and he shrugs at me and I shrug at everybody else. And we all stand there and we go, and I go, come on then, bring him up. <laughs> oh. And sure enough, and the guy goes, I think that's your dog over there. And over the other side of the field, there he was bringing the sheep down. Brave dog. Wow. I mean, how on earth he knew where I was, I have no idea. No idea. But wow. Yeah, you know, they, they come up with the goods. So that's the sort of... You know, that, that sort of, yes, we try and be positive. Oh, we can see all these good things happening. But we can also see this this very poor, you know, this is just marketing. This is not good training. This is a person that's trained this dog to do just one thing. And I can't see the broad richness of the training behind it at all. There's, there's no demonstration of what else you can do with this dog or other dogs. It's, it's just this, this is it, one off. This is sexy. Good. And then I look at the dog and see the dog's uncertainty and doubt in their face. You know, we can all prepare dogs for on-camera training. It's not difficult, but you have to prepare the dog for it. You can't just expect the dog to work out what's happening. And and the thing that always kind of sticks in my craw a little bit is, and, and I actually wrote about it fairly recently, is that if I were a good trainer, my dog could do insert whatever. And that's that's not the definition of good training. No, 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 no. That, you know, in a way, that's a trainer that will make a dog do whatever they want it to do. Right. And that's not good training. No, that is no. Not and that's training. often 
a casualty of dog sports because the person's heart and ego is so wrapped up in the sport, they'll get a dog to suit the sport or they'll find the methods that get that dog to excel at that sport, whether it's beneficial for the dog or not. Now, if that is your particular bandwagon, well, then follow the people that are good at that sport because they probably don't put the dog's needs highest. They're going to put their own needs highest. Mm -hmm. But if that's not your bandwagon, then don't follow those people because they're going to one day say, hey, you need to sort that dog out. Hey, you need to take a stick to that dog. Oh, look, he's folding under pressure. You need to make him do it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's the sort of thing we'll get back at us. And I'm like, okay, I think I'll leave the ring now. Thank you very much, Judge. I'm out. Mm it's 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 a big calling uh to be able to you know uh, what i encourage people to do is like you said be a bit of a stalker be be a bit of a uh a person who watches and watches and watches yeah and then listen to that feeling you have inside you yes i think we've all got those little bells and we've stopped listening to them because of the quantity of information that's coming at us that's you know, 90% of it's fake because it's telling us it's brilliant, it's telling us it's fabulous, telling us it's marvellous, and this is the absolute way to do it because you will succeed if you do it this way. And I'm like, "Mm, no, I don't think so. You know, Mm. this is the best car. This is absolutely the best car for you. Yeah, no, you wouldn't trust a car salesman, so don't trust a dog training salesman. (laughs) (laughs) Because we're, you know, the car salesman's pitch is about just make the money. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we, we have a rather good television program over here. It's about the county court bailiffs going to collect money that was owed. And probably, you know, 40% of their cases are car problems. Mm-hmm. And somebody's been sold something wrong with a car. Oh. What a business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, same in the dog business. We, we have to be careful just because we love our dogs and we would do the best by them. It doesn't mean everybody else does. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I think that is a sign of good training is how prepared not just not not, not just prepared for what we call um you know if something goes wrong in the ring or something whatever but yeah, just how yeah, prepared yeah, they are yeah, as an individual yeah. like yes, uh yes. i it aside from uh talking to the camera and ignoring the dog it's this um don't even ask her a question don't she's she's working with her dog right now and and those people who are fully prepared to be present with the dog yeah i love that and they're not scrambling around for no they're not scrambling around for if they are using a clicker they're not scrambling around where's my clicker which pocket did i put it in which pocket where'd my treat pots go it's like the teacher walking into a classroom but they they don't know what they're going to do or they haven't got their you know classroom work prepared or they don't know who they're teaching or they don't know enough about the subject you know these are all elements of somebody that should be a good teacher Mm-hmm. Yep, they're prepared. They've mm-hmm. done their homework. They know their students. They know what level they're at. They know what they should be preparing next. They've got a long term goal. They know what they taught last week and they know what they're going to teach next week. You know, mm-hmm. all those things need to be in place. And again, that will show in the dog's confidence in the person. Yes. You know, I mean, you know, to turn up at a class and go, oh, what are we going to do this week? Oh, I don't know. What do you like to do? Oh, Lord. Oh, <laughs> it's like, yeah. No, no, I'm expecting you to help me on this. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, you know, if you are going to do a dog sport, I think you've got a two year apprenticeship going to learn that sport before you oh, start excellent. training the dog. Oh, Go excellent. help out. Go steward. I mean, I've had people come to me and said, oh, would you teach me Santa's answer? And I go, been to a show yet? No. Where do I find one? Well, oh. You come back to me in a year's time when you've been to a few shows, then I might think about teaching you. It's not my job to teach you the sport if you're coming to me to learn about the training. You should know the rules. You should know different jumping heights. You should know distances. You should know how much music you need to go in the ring. You should know what treats your dog likes. Yes, all those elements need to be in place before you start to choose your trainers. Yes. Yeah, and it's not just people that are successful. Have they trained more than one dog? Mm-hmm. Have they done it again and again? Is it just a one-off? Mm-hmm. Yep. I, and people not are all, just, you know, there can be wonderful one... trainers that get one dog, and that dog carries them through, or their coach that they use carried them through, and we don't see them train another dog. It could be for perfect valid reasons, like they've only got one leg; they can't do the running anymore. But often they they can't apply what they've learned from one dog to another dog. And different breeds of dogs, I think. Not that... necessarily, because I think there's enough variety within a breed. Oh, you think so? Huh? Oh, yes, 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 mm. yeah. That you know, yes, 
Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I might, I might disagree about... just a little bit just because if I look at, you know, obviously coming from the sheltering world, if you can't adapt to the wide variety you might see in sheltering. Yeah, but you're teaching basic um, foundation skills for being able to live with people. Right. The minute you go into something like um, sheepdog trials or agility, you're talking about athletic dogs more. Indeed, indeed. I would yep. give you or, that for sure. you know, if you want to go into obedience, you're talking about a limited number of dogs. Or if you're going to do um, retriever work, you know, you could always have just one breed retriever, but they'll all be different. Mm -hmm. They'll all be different within it. Yeah, I'll give you that for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so trust. Are you reliable as a person? Uh, what other good training things do we just go? Yeah, that's good. The language, the language the person would use. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, when I hear jargon thrown around and it's not being used correctly or it is just jargon for the sake of sounding good. So they might throw in an odd pre-Mac and a couple of drivey words. <laughs> <laughs> or um, <laughs> you know pressure the dog's crumbling under pressure or the dog blows you off or more blows out or whatever the american phrase is you know you know oh he can't you know he hasn't got the stamina for it you know there's derogatory ways of describing it and blaming the dog for not having what that person expects them to have yeah. you know is it something that should have been taught is it it's like saying a dog has a nice temperament or a good temperament i have no idea what that is mm -hmm. you know because what i would consider a good temperament is not what somebody else would want you know i want a friendly dog but you want a dog that's going to go and say up to everybody and jump all over them be friendly oh no no no, no not that friendly but i don't <laughs> want a nasty dog well you know it, these terms don't help us at all so when you hear someone that's supposed to be a good trainer or a professional trainer, misuse of the language, it should be recognised. It should send you up alarm bells, you know, like hearing a politician with all the promises that they can't promise. Yeah. You know, it's like you just don't trust it because you can't promise you don't know what's going to happen next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't promise this is not going to happen. Uh, but uh, uh, that's one of the, I mean, okay, I purposely ask people when they say those things, I say, I've never heard that. What's that mean? And I <laughs> purposely ask them to explain it. Well, you know, when they're, yes, yes. no, I, I, I don't, you know, I mean, it's one of my sister and I call, um, uh, obvious ignorance, you know, okay, I'll be yeah, the stupid yeah. person here now. Um, or, or, and what we're seeing is dangerous ignorance. You're yes. dangerously educated to the point they know a little bit of words, but not enough to give you the fullness of it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when I used to do these sort of, schools inspection things because we got our college courses paid by the government but in return we had to go and sit and watch other people teach and assess whether they were doing their job properly or not you know one of the questions i thought was a real telling question the student has confidence in the teacher's knowledge yes so that if a student's learning motor vehicle maintenance and he asks mr williams why he's doing this mr williams has the depth of knowledge to be able to answer him or to be able to say good question we'll cover that in lesson six yes yeah and okay that's fine because i know if this has come up before when people ask questions we cover it later it's not just a wash off or you do have the um depth of knowledge to be able to say okay let's stop for a minute and have a look at this further right now because this is a good point we need to bring up but when it's oh well you don't need to know that okay i'll take my money elsewhere <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, if it's something you want to know the answer of, you do need to know that. You know, if I'm baking a cake, do I use self-raising flour or should I use plain flour with baking powder? It's, it's oh, you kind don't of need the, to know that. It, well, it depends. Well, exactly, but on yeah. what? You know, if I'm going to make this decision, oh, just follow the recipe, it'll be all right. <laughs> oh. Does it matter that I use 330 grams or can I go a little bit over, a little bit under? No. Oh, it doesn't matter, you don't need to know that. Actually, it makes a very significant difference. Yes. Yep. Yes, it does. Does it matter? Oh, I've only got large eggs. Should I, you know, it, all these things. If I have a question about it, it matters. There it matters. Is. And yeah. eggs vary in size. <laughs> <It's> like, <no. laughs> so if you're using large eggs, you adapt one or the other to it. Yeah. Good. Uh, good. You know, so nowadays we've got so much um, information available 
we should be asking more questions. Yes, you know, and again, the credentials that people throw at us. Well, what does that mean? Ask the questions. What did you learn from going on that course? What did that seminar teach you? Why do you do all these other courses? Oh, I want to learn as much as possible. OK, could you explain to me what you've learned? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, where's this taking you? Where are you heading with this? What are you about? You know, I, I see we used to, <laughs> used to it's called the seminar effect. So I've run classes for nearly 50 years now. And you would have a sort of, um, oh, the Wednesday night group are in. And last weekend they went on a seminar with, uh -uh. Mm -hmm. yes, and they learned all about, uh -uh. so they're all doing uh -uh this week. I go, why are you doing that? Well, we've just spent a whole weekend on it. Yeah, but why are you doing it now? I've been teaching this for two years and you've ignored it. And suddenly this person <laughs> says, and you're doing it. Oh, and so, you know, that consistency of following, you know, your direction is a compass, not a path. Going on a seminar says, oh, you must walk this path because this path is going to lead you to the end of the rainbow. Actually, I'm just heading in this direction. It's fine for me. I'm following my compass. That path might not take me, but I'll have a look down it as long as it heads towards where I'm heading. That's fine. But I'm not just going down a path because it looks an attractive path, which is a lot of lot that's being sold. A lot of what is being sold is a, oh, this shortcut will get you to the same spot, but you don't have to do so much work. Mm -hmm. The work is the enjoyable bit. The work is what it's about. And that's what we put our heart and soul into. And when we do the work, you know, the one thing about dog training, I guarantee you, you do the work, you get the results. I don't know any other thing that I've done that's been hard work to do and constantly paid off with good results. I can tell you, it's not baking anyway. <laughs> it's like problems with flour. <laughs> oh, it might have been old flour. I don't know, but it tastes disgusting. That's going, I haven't got the chickens anymore, but that would have gone to the chickens, you know. Um, but you do some stuff with the dogs, you put time into the dogs, you put effort into the dogs, payback always comes back for you. Mm. Yeah, it really is. Okay. So, you know, other things I like to look for, not asking the dog to do too much too soon, you know, and this is particularly obvious when we're rearing young dogs. So we've got a dog at 16 weeks old and our other dog that we had at 16 weeks old, he was able to do this at this age, but this one doesn't. Well, maybe it's just too much too soon for this dog, you know, um, even with own, our own, you know, human education, a year of students covers 10 months of different ages and anyone that's brought up a child knows that one child that's 10 months older than another child is not going to have the same ability well that can happen within dogs even though they might be exactly the same age to the day genetically they're carrying a different package they're carrying a different history up to that point they're carrying different qualities within their makeup that allows them to cope with this situation or not cope with this situation so any time we see a dog not coping with a situation, it's up to us to take the dog out of it and say this is too much too soon, not just blow it through and hope the dog will sort itself out. Yes, um, and, but the dog fails and then learns what? Not to trust people because they'll push exactly. you to do things you can't do. Mm -hmm. So not about pushing the dog to learn something because the others do, you know, especially when people all have a puppy from the same litter. Yes, one thing goes wrong for one person, OK, he just needs more time for it. That's all. It's not about getting something done by a date. It's getting something done when that dog is ready to do it. The minute we start running on a calendar for dog training, my goodness, we're in trouble. And training should never be measured on that, you know, temporal basis. Oh, I've got to have this ready by three weeks or this dog should be able to do this at seven months old. If he's ready, he's ready. If he's not, he's not. He has not asked them to do more than they can. Yes, and this which is, is all part of the preparation as well, making sure right. they're well prepared for what they've got to face. And this is the total opposite of setting a goal for yourself. You know that that's different. That's like let's say I'm gonna I'm gonna you know in a couple of years I'd like to or six months I'd like yeah, to, but yeah. it's not make or break. The goal is the long term target, but even then, exactly. yeah, you can say there should be a certain amount of progress on it that gives you some urgency because you can't keep waiting for the conditions to be perfect. And then I'll right. be able to do this, that, and the other, you know, you might have a long-term goal in mind, um, but that doesn't mean it has to be achieved within a certain time period, unless it's a time fixed thing. It's the minute we have this time pressure, the learning goes out the window. 
learning to do it properly is how you move forward. So I'm going to learn how to do C when I'm very competent at B. How do I know I'm competent at B? Because I can do it in different places and I can apply it to different things. Good. Now you're ready to learn C. One of the courses I did um, to keep myself busy in the evenings was um, on graphics and design. And the first year we learned how to use lots of different tools. So you learn ink, pencil, uh, different types of pencil. And every week we had to draw two objects from around the house, something like a spark plug or a hoover or a, you know, a pen or something else like that. The second year we were allowed to use color <laughs> because we need to learn all of those basics in that mono, you know, one single element of black and white and different shades of gray long before we can actually use it start to use color. So we had to be able to represent depth and three dimensions and, you know, just get our accuracy in drawing before we can actually move on to color. And, you know, that was the structure of the learning. Oh, well, I want to use color now. Well, no, not, you're not ready. You know, so, oh, well, you should be able to use color by next week. Well, no, and you're not ready until you've got the abilities to do these things to a certain level of competency. So, you know, recognizing that for the dog it is critically important, critically important. Okay. That's, that's hard. A lot of people really have a difficult time identifying that stuff. Mm -hmm. Really mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. So that makes you a good trainer when you start, are able to identify when your dog is ready to move on. Yeah, a good quality trainer. It doesn't matter whether I'm looking at somebody training a field I've never been in before. I can still recognize those, those skills. Mm -hmm. you know and our field is is very much well we do what's best for the dog and i'm not going to put a dog in a sport that it would be uncomfortable for you know something like here work to music where you're surrounded by 100 people and you could have put up with loud noises and in indoor venues well that's not suitable for every dog not mm -hmm. at all mm -hmm. as always information on courses can be found on k's website learningaboutdogs.com the link in the episode notes. And for small intensive training opportunities, check into my Facebook page, Sue Teaching Dogs. Hey, have a great summer off. We'll see you next season. Dog.